Divine Truth. Name of this presentation is Question and Answer with People in Bathurst. It is part of the general discussion series. It was presented in Bathurst, New South Wales, Australia on the 17th of June, 2012. So, shall we continue with that discussion, or you would like to ask some different questions? What, what would you like to do? Continue. <laughs> One person says continue. So you can stay, and the rest can leave, and, <laughs> and we'll continue. <laughs> what would you like to do? Would you like to have some different questions, or...? Because uh, I feel we covered a fair bit of that subject today about um, you know what what's actually blocking us in our relationship with God and why we find our relationship with God quite difficult to embrace. And in fact, uh, I, we probably should call that discussion questions about our relationship with God, perhaps. But um, I feel that the reason why we find so many other subjects fascinating is because that particular subject that is the most beneficial for us to understand we have the most blockages to to actually understanding so or, or feeling about so if you can be aware of that in your own progression that would be it's going to help you a lot if you can be aware that though, that that's what's actually happening can I ask you a sure can we call God something else? Ah. <laughs> like, honestly, because that word is like brings all these memories of... The reason why I use the word God is purposefully so that you can feel your blockages. To the word. Because, because um, the reality is that if I use another term, all I'm doing is, is acceding to an addiction. The addiction is, don't, don't use the word God. There's the addiction. And that addiction is covering what? It's covering lots of fears and other belief systems that we need to release. So... In the end, we should be able to almost call God anything and get away with it <laughs> um, in terms of it not being something that you feel opposition to. Now, I, I feel that one of the main reasons why a discussion about God causes people to be distressed is because the word God itself has all of these negative connotations inside of many people. And, and it's the negative connotations about the word that are a part of the emotions we need to address with God. Right? And so for that reason, I'm going to continue to use the word God. <laughs> Until everybody in my audiences go, I'm completely comfortable with that word, and then I might use another word. <laughs> Does that make sense? Here you go, thanks. Um, a question about feminine and masculine side of God. Yes. Uh, like when I relate to God in a prayer, I'm, I'm having trouble to combine them. <coughs> it's either I say mother, God, mm -hmm. and I think about the feminine side, mm -hmm. or father. Mm -hmm. I, and I can't say mother, father, God, you know, it's not. <laughs> no, I, and I feel the word mother, father, God is like one, two, three, four, five syllables, mother, father, God, <laughs> and it's already too long. Yeah. <laughs> and the, it's the emotion that you feel that's the important thing, remember. So you remember God feels you and you can feel God. So, so obviously when you use the term mother, it's going to have certain connotations. And if you use the term father, it's going to have certain connotations. Now, if we examine the two, the two words that we will use often when we're speaking with God, so I use the term mummy, um, reminding myself that I'm just a little child, and daddy, right? That's my terms for God. Now, with my mummy, I, obviously, if I have aspects to work through emotionally with my earthly mum... The, the mum who was a part of creating my physical body and my spirit body, 
And with daddy, if I have emotions related to my earthly daddy, then that is certainly going to impact upon um, when I use the term mummy for God, it's going to impact upon how I feel when I'm using that term. And words do have association to emotions inside of each of us. So, so some, for some of you, when I use the term mummy, some of you think, oh, that's cute. You know, that somebody, like, some of you think, what's, what's, why, why mummy? Like, that's pretty stupid. You know, there'll be, other, there'll be feelings that each individual has associated with each word that is used. Now, mummy, mum, mother, while they all mean the same thing from a language perspective, they do not all mean the same thing from an emotional perspective for many of us. So for, for, a, for a person who's been actually abused by their mother, the word mother is going to have some pretty harsh connotations, isn't it? And for a person who's been abused by their dad, right, the word dad's going to have some pretty harsh connotations too. But the reality is God is our mummy and daddy. Um, God does fulfil both roles. And in fact, uh, we often, what, what we often need to do is break away from our mummy and daddy on earth and, and instead connect to God as this person. But the problem is all of those words have different connotations inside of us and as a result of that, whenever we think of God being one of those things, we will, it will always have some kind of emotional connection to something generally that's happened in our life in re reflection of our relationship with either our mother or our father. So for example, if your daddy wasn't in your life at all, if your dad wasn't even, you, know, you never even had a dad in your life, you, you grow, grew up in a single parent family, then the word daddy doesn't really mean much except for being rejected and left and abandoned. Right? Um, but if you've had a present dad who's really involved in your life in terms, of, um, in terms of lovingly involved in your life, then the word dad would have some very loving connotations inside of yourself when you felt about that word. If uh, your daddy was a person who was heavily involved in your life and emotionally oppressive and you know, always bossing you around and pushing you around and telling you what to do and punishing when you didn't do it, then you, you're, the word daddy is going to have, again, some fairly negative connotations in your life, yes? Yeah. So as a result of that, um, it, these words all will have some kind of emotional linkage to, to what you feel when you, when you use those words in relation with God. Now, I see a lot of people writing the term, you know, mother... Father, God. <laughs> now, to me, um, it almost emotionally distances me from God, that term. I don't know what effect it has on you, but it almost, to, for me, what it does is it, it sounds like I'm trying to be politically correct, right, with regard to my reference to God. Instead of just using the term God or mum or dad, or mother or father, when I refer to God, if I have to use that kind of terminology, then there, there's obviously some issues inside of me emotionally that I have about political correctness or what is the correct way of referring to God. And the, you know, when you have an emotional relationship with God, you're not worried about the correct way to refer to God. Uh, and if you, if you think about it, if you have an emotional relationship with your partner, you're not working out in your mind, do I call her... Um, do I call her Mary Suzanne Luck or do I call her Mary Luck or do I call her Mary or Miriam or uh, like MM or, or Maz or what do I call her? You don't think about it, do you? Do I call her darling or love or, you know? The reality is whatever you feel in the moment is probably what you're going to use, yes? So, and really it needs to be the same with our relationship with God. You know, God's not concerned about the terminology we use. But understand that every terminology we have for God does have emotional connotations. That will be very reflective of what's happened with our earthly mother or father. Mm. Uh, <coughs> uh, <coughs> yeah, <coughs> sorry. I, I have a question, a um, mediumistic, sorry, a question about um, channeling. Yeah. 
So, um, have we finished this subject then? Everyone's happy with that? We've exhausted that, have we? The reality is you cannot ever exhaust the subject of God. But anyway, we'll, go, we'll proceed. <laughs> Fire away. So we're, I'm just starting out channeling and um, we've been channeling different spirits and releasing spirits mm -hmm. with some success, I, I imagine. Yeah. It's hard to sort of gauge, get a good gauge on it. Mm -hmm. um, but lately there's been single mums that have, we've tried to help. Mm -hmm. and, um, single mums on earth, you mean, or in the yeah. spirit world? Well, on earth. On earth, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And inevitably there's a band of these angry women. With them, yes. With them. Yes. Um, and there's a lot of fear with, with this person trying to... They've been desperately trying to get past this issue with neediness to men or having an injury uh, from the parents, yep. I assume. Um, I was just wondering if I could get a bit of insight into how to proceed because I get to the point where... They're very difficult to move on. These these women are trying to trying to get some sort of conversation meaningful. There's a lot of so much anger, so much fierce. And uh, you're a man as well. Uh, which, and I'm a man as well. Which makes it more difficult. Yeah, yeah, we've 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 done some had some success with female channels. Yeah, and that's obviously better. Nice. <clears throat> no, I don't feel it's obviously better. No. Well, but we've had more success. You know, you'll have more seeming success, but that doesn't mean you have more success. The reason why is because the, the, the female channel is just acceding to the, to the women's spirit's addiction that they don't address the man. So, so at the end of the day, of course it's going to be easier, but at the end of the day it doesn't necessarily mean that they've resolved anything okay, towards men. Interesting. Yep. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if we, if we look at the dynamics of what's actually happening to, to mo a lot of people who are single on earth, and this applies to males and females that are single on earth, not in relationship, and not in relationship for long terms or periods of time... So whether they are a woman or a man, let's choose the example you've given, a woman, um, they're often associated or surrounded by the same gender sex in the spirit world of women who have had a very, very similar hurtful experience to the woman who's on earth. So, for example, the woman on earth might have had some previous hurtful experiences with men. For example, rejection by her father from father, let's just, uh, a feeling of being um, uh, controlled by father, yeah. a feeling of being manipulated by dad, a feeling of not being wanted, loved. And then often during their life they've attracted a lot of men who've treated them generally sometimes quite abusively as well. Mm. So there's a tendency towards abusive uh, based relationships. Um, which, which enhances, if you like, or increases the anger they feel. Yep. Now remember always that anger usually is the result of our addictions not being met. And that our addictions get created because we don't want to feel our fears. And our fears are created because we generally have a lot of grief that people do not want us to experience. And so what they do is they, you know, cause us to get into a state of fear about feeling our grief. And so then we are also, and then for most women, fear is a terrible feeling to feel, and so they'll revert to the addiction. For most men, men are willing generally to feel their fears a little more, but not less so their emotional fears, but the greatest emotional fear in most men is grief. Now, the greatest emotional fear in women is not grief. Most women are more comfortable with grief. Their greatest emotional fear is fear. In other words, the, the, the opposition that most women have to dealing with their emotions is not to do with their grief but their fear. The opposition that most men have to dealing with their emotions is their grief. Right? A lot of men will embrace fear-based situations whereas a woman will always try to run generally from a fear-based situation unless the woman is angry <laughs> and then she'll address the situation. 
Now, that's a general flow, and that applies to both genders, right? Whatever is happening with both genders. So if we look at what's going on, this woman here, obviously she has a lot now of fear about her relationship with men because of these emotions that are now within her. And that causes her then to be very wary of entering long-term relationships. So she might finish up having a sexual relationship, but not living with a person or having a long-term relationship with a person. Or she'll... Um, you know, she will constantly, she'll feel that she's better off single, is probably the best way of putting it. Yep. And the same applies to a male in a similar situation where a male is surrounded by a heap of angry men. He'll feel he's better off single and he'll use women how he wants to use them, but he won't want to engage a relationship with them for, for similar or different reasons. But here we have, we have the troop, shall we call them, <laughs> of spirits, sometimes quite large numbers actually. And, um, and these spirit, spirits wish to in, make this person um, feel safer and secure and, and feel like uh, they don't have to have a relationship with a man and all those kind of mm. things. So, so these women already have these beliefs themselves. All of those women feel that way towards men. Mm. Now that they're in the spirit world, of course, often they feel that way towards men much more strongly than they allowed themselves to feel while they're on earth. Right? And so what they do is they band together in groups generally and then they surround a woman on earth who they feel needs their assistance or seems to want their assistance. The same applies to a male who's being influenced by a group of men in the spirit world. Same sort of, same sort of thing applies. And sometimes she'll even have a group of men surrounding her at the same time, right, who want to pander to the woman who's angry. So they'll pander to those and they'll pander to those and so those women will let those men be around mm. as a result. So it starts to get pretty complicated from a, from a spirit perspective in terms of the influences upon the individual. Now, any influence of a spirit on an individual is totally about the addictions of the individual. Mm. So... If I've got a group of spirits surrounding me who are influencing me in a certain direction, that is because my addiction to want them surrounding me and that I am unwilling to confront them on a number of levels. And this is not just about their agreement with my emotion. It's also about my fear of confronting their emotion. So, if you're a woman who's had a series of negative experiences with a male, and then you sit down in a table with a group of ten other women, and all of them have had negative experiences with a male, and then all of a sudden you, as that woman, start to have a good experience with a male, and you start relating this good experience to the ten women who have only had negative experiences with a male, what do you think the general response of those, negative, of those other women were going to be? They'll be saying things like, oh, it's only one of them and you can never trust them anyway and you don't know whether he's like that and there's probably things you haven't found out about him. And, and, and in the end, it's going to be very, very difficult for you in that group of people to actually fully embrace your own feelings of trust when they are all reflecting back at you their own mistrust. Right? And so what's, what often happens is that Besides having this group of emotions with men, there is also a list of emotions that the same woman will have with women. And that will be things like this. Fear of rejection from the actual women as well. Fear of anger. And so forth. A lot of it will be related to fear towards the same gender. So this is what she feels towards the opposite gender and this is what she feels towards the same gender. And this is how little groups occur where we eventually go down the track of going, um, you know, we all get to, all the men get together with their mates, have a bit of a bitch session about their women and, and, but none of them say any of those things to their women. Right? And then all the women get together with their friends and they have a bit of a bit section with, about their men, but none of them say any of those things towards their men. Right? And, and what that does is it maintains the intergender emotional injuries, and we seek out 
the people who will support our injury, uh, which is very counterproductive to our future growth, both towards God and also towards any soulmate relationship. The reality is we need to somehow confront these emotions. Now, when you start speaking to a group of spirits who are surrounding the person, you've got to bear in mind that this person is attracting this group of spirits. And this person needs to look at their reasons why they want these spirits with them. Now, there is a lot of people who on earth who have spirits surrounding them and who know they have spirits surrounding them. And then when you say to them, you want them with you, they'll bite your head off, basically, because they, they feel that they don't want them with them. And that is a lack of honesty. Because the reality is the law of attraction works perfectly. There is something in our soul that attracts this group of women. And in this case, there's two things. There's the fear of the group of women who are angry with men. And there is the anger with the men that attracts such a group that is inside the person. Does that make sense? So they are afraid of women who feel the same way and they are angry with the men who treated them badly. And so what they want, the only kind of men they'll actually accept in their life is a group of men who pander to them. But of course they won't want a relationship with them because it's not equal and, and therefore you feel like you're always nursing them and, and of course you never finish up having an equal relationship and so no relationship can really last very long unless you are perfectly embracing the addiction. The problem with perfectly embracing an addiction is generally what we do, we initially embrace an addiction and we feel great about it and then six months later all the other parts of the problems of the relationship start appearing and because the addiction is no longer getting met we no longer feel an attraction. And, uh, and so we leave that relationship and go on to another one uh, who meets our addiction and then they meet our addiction for three months, six months, nine months, a year maybe and then all of a sudden we're no longer getting that addiction met either and so we no longer want that relationship or we detune from that relationship. For some of us we get married to them and then we feel like we're bound to stay with them for the rest of our life and so we do even though we don't really like them very much at all after a while which is often happens in a relationship. Either way, it's all driven from a reason within the person's soul as to all of these attractions. Now, if you're trying to help a group of spirits who are surrounding the person without addressing the addiction in the person, then that person is going to continue to, to attract spirits like this into their lives constantly. Mm. Sometimes you're better off, if this person here is not willing to deal with their addictions, you're better off leaving the original group of spirits with the person than you are trying to get those spirits to move forward. Does that make sense? Yeah. And the reason why is that, uh, is that they're going to be much more comfortable with this group than another group that comes along who they don't know. <coughs> and they also are not being truthful with themselves in the sense that they need to address the underlying emotion that causes the addiction. Mm. Just let me have a cough. So... What I would suggest that needs to occur with any form of helping a spirit when you know those spirits are surrounding an individual is this. This person's emotional addictions need to be accurately addressed. And if that person demonstrates a willingness to address those addictions, then it would be wise also to discuss things with the spirits with them. Now, the spirits with them, if this person is willing to address their addictions, the spirits with that person will go through a series of um, what I would classify as interactions with the individual. The first interaction is they will threaten her. If she is truly sincere about dealing with her addictions, these spirits will threaten her because these spirits will want to maintain the addiction. So they will threaten her with things like, you know, if she enters a relationship, they'll go, he's going to treat you bad, he's going to treat you bad. And they're, they're, it's like having people in your ear constantly all day saying, he's going to treat you bad, he's going to treat you bad, he's going to make your life hard, he's going to treat you badly. Notice what he's doing here, see there's something up to that. And notice what he's doing there, they make you very suspicious, right? So these spirits will do that firstly. Because they want to maintain the, their addiction of having control of this woman, right? 
Um, now, if this woman is very sincere, she will address why she's so afraid of these women. She will work her way through that. Right? And, and therefore, when we start to discuss with this group of women what's going on, if this person isn't giving them the approval that they need, now we have much greater opportunity to help this group of spirits to move forward in their life. Yep. But if this person is holding on to their addictions for dear life and doesn't, don't, doesn't want to release any of their addictions at all, then this group of spirits are going to be attracted to her and it's going to be very hard for this group of spirits even to move forward because they're going to feel drawn back to feeding the addiction all the time. So one of them, either them or them or this person, has to get rid of their addictions for the relationship to break. And we want the relationship to break as it is because it's not loving. Yeah. Um, but it, so it's a matter of helping either this person or this group of people with their addictions. Mm. If you can help one or the other, then the relationship can break and then you can actually work on the actual emotional issues inside the person. Yeah. So if she... If if, if she's mediumistic, does that make it even more accentuated, does it? Or? Yes, if she is mediumistic, she will feel their impressions much more strongly. Mm. She will feel their pressure a lot more strongly. When they threaten her, she will actually feel that strongly as well. She will feel frightened for no particular reason. Mm. Um, she, will, she will look at a man and even have feelings like the thoughts that enter her mind that these guys are going, no, don't look at her. You know, like she, any, any sign of an attraction in her towards a male, these spirits will be attempting to influence in a negative direction. They will only allow her to get together with a pandering male. Mm. Right? That's all they will allow her to do. And even many of them won't even allow that. Yep. Um, so this is all just one core emotion? No, no. This is, this is all the emotions, the group of emotions relating to her father or during her childhood relating to men that got created through her interactions with men. So it's not just one emotion. It can be a whole group or series of emotions. Okay. Yep. Um, what are they... When we embark on them and start channelling, mm. it's almost like the spirits come out like they're annoyed because they're actually in the spotlight. There's, there's exactly. Many of these people who are controlling people on Earth have been used to doing it for many, many years without being exposed. And so as soon as they get exposed, there is the potential of a breakdown in this relationship. You know, if this person knew they were being influenced so much, they might change. Mm. So what, what a lot of these spirits attempt to do is they attempt to have this person not know that they're being influenced so much. Does that make sense? Mm. And, and quite often I've seen this happen in audiences where... A person asks me a question about the spirit influence they're under. I start speaking them to them about the influence and they go to sleep while I'm speaking to them. <laughs> That's how strong the influence of this group of spirits is on many people. Mm. They can even just cause you to shut down. Oh, I, can't. I didn't hear that. I didn't hear that. And some of the recordings that we've done, you'll hear people say, oh, I didn't even hear anything you just said. And that's because they, you know, turning off their ears, you know, trying to shut them down. And they have so much control over the person mm. that they can do this at will. And so the person doesn't realise that they're being heavily influenced a lot of their life by a group of spirits who want them to be, remain in the same space. And, that they, and if they knew the influence were occurring, they might be less involved in the addiction. Does that make sense? Mm. So when you start discussing with them, this is an addiction, this is something inside of you that's avoiding these particular emotions or these particular emotions or both, and once you start describing that to them, they start realising, ah, I don't want to be controlled by a group of spirits, and like I don't want to be controlled by these women, I do want to have a relationship at the end, you know, I do want to have my soulmate or whatever. And so she starts feeling like she wants to work through things, now these spirits are in a very exposed state because they now can no longer have the same influence on her but they want the influence back. So now they'll threaten her or bribe her, you know, with emotions usually. So, so the threats come with emotions of anger and rage and the bribes come with like, I'll give you a nice pretty feeling as long as you do what I want type of thing. Yeah? And these spirits will attempt to do that with the person. Mm. This person is going to have to be very sincere about addressing their particular emotions. If 
this relationship is ever going to break. Mm. Yeah. So there's a hook. The, they often, sorry. Yeah, just hold sorry. it up a bit. Uh, they often have um, a lot of anger. They, they, I think the hook is that they, they get the powerful anger. Yes. And one of the hooks they're, is they're addicted to that. Remember, every time spirits are drawn to us, we have a hook. So if you liken it like a big fish hook, you know, like imagine this is a hook and a big fish hook that's, uh, that's hooked into those people. And, and the hook is all about we don't feel powerful, we need these people to feel powerful. We don't feel loved, we need these people with us to feel loved. We don't feel like we're acknowledged. We need these people to acknowledge us. We might have thousands of different emotional hooks that cause specific spirits to be attracted to us. And the, if we're personally not willing to address the emotional hook that draws mm. them to us, then we'll be totally under their influence Why we want them with us. And when I say totally, for many people, it is total. We, we did a talk in London uh, at the beginning of this year and the very first talk we gave in London, which you might, I think it is on YouTube now, um, there was about, in the entire audience, there was about 80 or 90 people in the audience, and, and the majority of the people in the audience were completely overcloaked by spirits. In other words, the whole reason why they had actually come was because spirits wanted to come. <laughs> and the question, like, there was one lady up in the back asking me questions, and her head, eyes were rolling back in her head while she was asking me the question. So she was just totally overcoat by a spirit. And when I addressed that, that spirit just, just went silent. And then the woman just looked at me as like, Am I, are you interacting with me or what's going on? Like she was totally confused about what was going on. Mm -hmm. and, and that's because many of us are so strongly influenced that we, and we prefer the influence because it makes us feel strong or it makes us feel like somebody loves us, makes us feel mm -hmm. like somebody cares for us and so forth. And, and it also guides a lot of our day-to-day -day life. Like a lot of our life's decisions are made not by ourselves, but by people saying, do this, do that, do this, do that. And we go, okay. <laughs> and we just go along with, with those decisions without much thought because we want the feelings they give us. The, the emotional addictions inside of us as individuals create so many negative, so many negative um, consequences in our lives, yeah? So every injury we've got, has an, there's a spirit attached to that. that Not right? necessarily. You mm. see, the reality is that the spirits will only attach if our injury has an addiction associated with it. Mm. The problem that we do have is that most of our injuries have addictions associated with them and it's the addictions that cause the interrelationship problems with spirits and with people on earth. So, so if we're, we, could have, we could have emotional injuries like fear or grief and if we did not have any will to address our addiction then the spirits would have very little effect on us. But as soon as we get involved in the addiction now we're, mm. now we're going to be affected quite strongly. Yes. So could these be different aspects of our personality? Um, not our pristine personality, no. Mm. Um, it will always be associated with some kind of emotional addiction, so some kind of hurt or grief that we've, uh, in, in, we've experienced when we were little or some kind of fear that we don't want to feel from when we were little uh, that causes these addictions. And, and most of us desire to have the addiction to be met rather than not met. And whenever it's not met, we get angry. So, so like, for, for example, I've had people in an audience where... They've been in an addiction with spirits. They're telling me that they are wanting to stop. They know that they're being influenced by the spirit negatively. They know that it's interfering with their relationship with, that they have with the person on earth. They know that it's interfering with their connection with God. They know that it's even in many cases damaging their relationship with their children. Like some of them have been quite abusive to their children as a result of the spirit influencing them. And yet when I tell them what the addiction is, they get angry with me. So that tells me how much they want to hold on to the addiction mm -hmm. and, and how strongly that addiction is entrenched inside of them. And, and so um, what we need to do... It, you see, if, if you talk about it, if every single person on earth was unwilling to engage in addiction, there would be no spirit influence. It doesn't matter what our condition is. There'd still be no spirit influence. Right? But okay. uh, the 
on the potentiality of every person on earth not uh, you know addressing their addictions and not wanting to stay in them is fairly remote at this point um, but I do feel down the track that's what will happen um, sorry to hold good uh, far away yeah um, so when when some so when uh, often when we speak to these spirits they're a lot of them are quite confused and mm -hmm. you know they find that they're sort of like in this what's going on they're not they're very it's quite dark and they're very confused some are some are much more um you know lucid mm -hmm. um what are they actually seeing of, what do they actually see physically around us mm -hmm. um i would suggest if you want to know what they see there's a very good book that was written in the 1920s um of a doctor he was a, a practicing physician who mm -hmm. had his wife was a medium and he was he would often have brought to him cases that could not be solved by other doctors and what he would do he was his, he would give the the patient a very small electric shock that they could not feel but the spirit could feel and the spirit would jump out of the patient and into mm -hmm. his wife and then he would have a discussion with the spirit through mediumship as to why they were connected to the person and so forth if you read that uh, book it, you'll, it'll give you a lot of background about all different types of illnesses and problems that people on earth face and how, what kind of spirit influence they're under facing mm. those particular issues. But if I can give you a general outline. Uh, by the way, that book is by Dr Carl Wickland. I'll just write that down. Dr Carl Wickland. You can download it from our website. Um, it's called 30 Years amongst the dead and it's about his doctoring over 30 years doing this uh, thing where he was a practicing physician with his wife doing the mediumship and reasoning with the spirits who were, attra who were attracted to different people who were causing them physical ailments anyway um, the reason why I bring that up is because you'll find that every single spirit has a different sort of feeling. But there are some general things that we can say about the spirits who are earthbound. And all of these spirits are earthbound. When they are earthbound, and this is what it actually looks like. Uh, here's the person on earth and their spirit body. So if you can think of their spirit body, much the same sort of size and shape as their, their material body. And then their soul is like an enveloping energy field around their bodies. Does that make sense? So their soul, there's two bodies are actually inside of their soul and, and contained by the soul and influenced by the soul. And the soul's emotions cause all sorts of issues with, with this problem. So what happens with certain emotions, there is an opening in the protective barrier that is afforded by the soul. So in other words, there is... A, so for example, if I have a deep feeling of sadness towards a male inside of my body, there will be an opening in my heart chakra area, right, that is about the male and the sadness that I feel about the male. If I have a deep feeling of sexual unworthiness, uh, then there'll be opening in the base chakra, uh, in the hole that surrounds my... In other words, spirits can attach to me through these broken energy fields. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, what happens is the spirits a lot of times don't even know why they are attaching because they also have a similar holes or what I would call codependent holes. So the spirit is like a person, right, surrounded by their soul. They no longer have a physical body, but they still have a body, the spirit body. And their soul, in their soul, they have different emotional injuries. Does that make sense? Now, one might be an emotional injury in the base or whatever. Another might be an emotional injury, you know, wherever the emotional injuries are in the different locations of their body there will be a hole in the protective barrier that their soul affords to their bodies. Because of that, there may be a flow. The spirits feel attracted to this one to get that addiction met. So that's an, every time there's a hole, there's also generally an addiction. Right? We want the hole filled. We want, we want the problem to go away. We want some satisfaction. 
whatever the satisfaction is. Now, if, if I'm in a, in a sadness with men, but on top of that, I'm also very, very rageful with men, and a lot of our rage will come from different chakras as well. If I'm in a rage with men here, so this is a woman who's in a rage with a man, and it's because her heart's been hurt a lot by men, and then she's had a lot of grief to release, and she hasn't released that grief, and what she's done is she's put a layer of hardness on top of that grief so that she doesn't have to feel the grief, then, then women who are also being hurt by men are going to feel some kind of camaraderie with this woman. And as a result of that, these women will actually attach themselves to her because of the emotional holes that are in them. So here's the spirit. They attach themselves to her through these emotional holes. You follow me? So a lot of times they're actually physically attached to the bodies, either physical or, 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 or spirit body, and usually both, drawing energy from the person or giving them energy depending upon what the exchange is. Remember, every addiction is like a to and fro of energy, energy being emotions in flow. So it's a, the energy in flow is an emotion, energy in motion is the emotion. And so the energy in flow, the emotion coming out of one person connects to the emotion in the other and it causes an attraction. And this person then feels bound to the body. And in fact, a lot of our physical illnesses are not actually ours. They are the result of addictions that we're trying to have fulfilled with spirits that cause certain spirits to be attracted to us and then they draw energy from our body in that particular location which causes the disease or the illness. Many cancers that women get, breast cancer, right hand side, is all about rage with men and these kind of emotional addictions being fulfilled with other women in the spirit world, for example. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. uh, it affects the physical body of the individual. Now, lots of spirits can even attach to one person in this way. Now, what this spirit generally sees in all of that is... See, when a spirit sees the earth, they don't see a nice, bright, sunny location like we see today. They actually see it as its true spiritual condition, which is very, very dark and grey. So they actually, when they look around them, they only see darkness and greyness and the figment of other people's interactions... And they feel bound to this person and a lot of times they are totally confused as to why. And the reason why is because the addictions are being met automatically without them even being conscious that the addiction is present. So this spirit can feel this person meeting their addiction and this person has this spirit meeting their addiction. And so this spirit is now in the what is called aura of this person and... How dark this person is will be how, what this person sees. So they might not see much at all. Does that make sense? Yeah. They might not see much at all. They might just see murky space, a few little outlines. See, when a spirit sees our physical body, he sees it like the flow of electrons in a very dark space because that's generally the darkness of the individual on the earth. And the brighter we get, the more loving we get, the brighter we get, the brighter... the the brighter the spirit, the spirit sees everything around it if a spirit is attached to us. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it'll differ depending on the person he's attached to or she's attached to. But generally, a person she's attached to or he's attached to is in the first dimension. The first dimension is quite a dark dimension. This spirit then doesn't see much light in their life. They, they just feel drawn to the person. They often are cursing the person that they're feeling drawn to and the, and they don't know why they're drawn to that person. They don't understand why. And they don't understand anything about addictions or emotions or, or truth or any of those things. And so they just feel drawn to them and they stay with them for the rest of their life until that person dies. And then they feel drawn to another person. And they go to another person and do the same thing. Yeah. Often they kill the person, actually. Mm. Not through any personal action, but because... They're drawing so much energy from the person's body that a certain part of their body starts causing a lot of trouble mm. and eventually causes a disease which eventually kills the person. And both of them are not even aware of what's going on in many cases. Yeah. So unless there's a sincere <coughs> willingness of the person, you're actually 
trying to help, then that's... that's so if this woman sense. here sincerely wishes to address her addictions, then that will slowly close up this hole. Does that make sense? Eventually this hole will get so closed, it won't be fully closed even, it'll just get closed enough that this person here no longer feels satisfaction. Right? Mm -hmm. And so they won't be attracted to them anymore. And they'll go somewhere else. Right? The alternative is this person here closes up their hole right? and no longer feels attraction to that person as a result of doing so. And if that's the case, mm. then the disconnection will also occur. Mm. So what we can do if we're a medium is we can help that person work out what's the whole all about, what's the emotional addiction all about, what's going on, why are they doing it, what, what, what do they want, and also talk to that person about all the same kind of things. Mm. Mm. Yeah, sometimes the, the spirit gets into the grief. Um, Fairly rapidly. Yeah. Yeah. More rapidly than the person on earth right. many times, yes. Because often these people have been in the spirit world in that condition for sometimes tens of years or hundreds of years. You imagine, you imagine living, in, just for a moment, you imagine living where you've passed over, you know you've passed, you know that you haven't, you know, that you haven't died but you, you've no longer got a physical body. But you feel bound to somebody you don't like or you don't feel like you like them and you feel bound to them. And on top of that, they're doing all these things that annoy you right? So, because that's what it feels like for the spirit oftentimes. They're doing all these things that annoy me. And I can't control them fully. I can't get them to do what I want. And on top of that, they, um, they are somehow something's keeping me there like a magnet and I don't know what it is. And on top of that, I can't see. I can't actually see clearly enough to see any light to see what is actually happening. You, you imagine that state. It's a pretty confusing state, yes? So, so that's how many of them are for many years. So they might be like that for 10 years or 15 years. You imagine being in a place for 15 years where you've had no sun, you've done nothing else other than be with that one person that you don't really like very much that you don't really care for very much, the person keeps on doing things you don't like them doing, you try to influence them and sometimes you do but sometimes you can't and it's so frustrating. You imagine being that frustrated for 15 years and then somebody comes along and tells you what's happening. You, you'd be gone. That's amazing. I want to know more, wouldn't you? Normally, the average person would. And that's why helping spirits is often easier than helping the person because this person has lived in a situation that's very distressing for them for a long period of time. And as a result of living in the situation for a long period of time, they are more ready to actually go through the process of changing it. Mm. Okay, <coughs> so... Um, it's okay, there's no other hands up. <laughs> Fire away. <laughs> so you, you've gone over um, breast, the reason for breast cancers and things. Do you have like any equivalent thing with... The injuries to associated with, say, prostate cancer in men, or mm -hmm. I'd be interested. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're all related to these kind of intergender injuries, mm. generally, and and of course, if they are related to our sexual organs in some way, then they're related to our view of sexuality. You know, everything is very, very specific the way God has created it. So every single potential injury that we can have in our physical body mm. is completely related to an emotion related to that area of the body, which which we're trying to get satisfied through an addiction. Every single thing. So rather than me give... I'll just have a coffee. Rather than me give specific answers to specific diseases, because we could go on for months doing that, mm -hmm. and if we understand that every single emotional injury that we have creates disease when we're in denial of the emotion, and every single disease is specifically related to the emotion that created it, Yep. So things like cancers, any form of disease, any viruses, any sickness and illness we have, any accidents we have, they are all related to something going on in the soul that we're in denial of. And the fact is that we have to be in a lot of denial before the soul creates a physical ailment. So that's telling us we're in huge denial of. And when we're in such large denial, we also attract spirits with the same similar denials which then causes them to be attracted to the same location in our body, which also destroys the energy system in that part of the body, 
which also creates further exacerbation to the actual original problem. Mm -hmm. And in the end, every single disease we face can be easily cured if we understood the relationship between the emotion, the disease, and our unwillingness to address it, the emotion I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. mm. Now, every spirit who is attracted to us, who also causes a disease, is attracted to us to that particular location for the same kind of reason, because of the emotion still existing in them as well. And it has to be some kind of codependent emotion, some, something that creates codependency. Okay. Fantastic. Now there's other hands. <laughs> Shall we go into them? <laughs> if we go back there. <clears throat> uh, I just wanted to ask from from that. I'm actually allergic to all synthetic chemicals, so pretty much the whole man-made environment. Mm -hmm. um, so as you were speaking, then I guess I just recognised myself in all the things that you were just. Yes. So if we're allergic, for example, if we're allergic to everything man-made, then that tells me there's an emotion in you about things that are man-made that needs to be addressed. Does that make sense? Once you address that emotion about things that are man-made, then every allergy to everything that you're allergic to man-made will disappear. And allergies are all resulting from generally from a lot of grief. So allergies generally relate to grief that we're unwilling to address or feel. So, for example, I don't know if some of you have allergies. Have you noticed that you only have allergies in certain situations? And it's not always the same physical situation, but if you notice, it will very frequently be the same emotional situation. Right? And this applies to things like asthma and other illnesses like that as well, uh, which are fear and grief related. They're all fear and grief related diseases. And, and so allergies is a, is a great thing to look at because, it, because you can cure it tomorrow. You can uh, that literally. would be great. <laughs> yeah, you, with all allergies, you can literally cure within a few days if you're willing to address the actual underlying emotional causes. With stuff like uh, diseases that are more uh, endemic in the body, so, so something like a cancer, it may take weeks to cure in comparison uh, once you've addressed the original causal emotion for it. But, but with stuff like allergies, you can cure them in a few days, generally. So there's some connection emotionally to things that are man-made that I need to work through? Yes, the fact is you're allergic to everything man-made, pretty much. Yeah. Right? So there's got to be some reason why you're allergic to everything man-made. That is emotional reason inside of yourself. Now, it could, there could be a spirit attached to it as well, to that particular problem, but it has to be due to the emotion that you have anyway. So the, the thing is to focus on the emotion. What do you feel about things that are man-made? What does your mummy and daddy feel about things that are man-made is a more important question. Because most of our allergies relate to our beliefs of our parents. Do you understand? So, for example, if, if, so this is me, the child. Here's my mum. Here's my dad. Most of my allergies, as a, which all develop during childhood generally, right? most of my allergies are related to belief systems in my mum and dad that I feel I must conform to right? and I feel oppressed by as a result. And the, so it's grief related to one or both of my parents. So, for example, I, I was very, very allergic to cats. When I say very allergic, I would swell up uh, around a cat. I just, my nose would stream, my eyes would water. Everything would be happening. Uh, I'd have to pump myself full of antihistamines, you know, just to calm it down. And even then, a lot of times, it didn't do it. I'd have, I'd have to get away from the cat. That was the only solution, actually. When I started feeling my way through it, there were events in my life related to my father that caused me to have a lot of those allergies. Uh, when I was about, uh, I think I was about six or seven years of age, my father shot around 35 cats and made me bury them. So I dug a hole for them all and buried them. So that was one of the events. My father's always had a deep rage with cats because of the attack of native animals um, that he feels, you know, shouldn't occur. So he shoots every cat on sight, pretty much, my father does. And as a result of that, I've got a lot, had a lot of conflicting emotions about cats. Yeah? 
But every time I was around them, I was allergic to them. Once I addressed those emotions and felt my grief about those situations and my grief of needing my father's approval about those situations, my allergy disappeared. And, uh, and that happened in... Once I realised what was going on, that happened within a couple of days. But it took me a few years to work out what was going on. Uh, but it, it just once it was released, a couple of days, I could have a cat sleeping in my bed or on my bed. Not a problem at all. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, when you spoke about um, spirits zapping energy, or the, you um, said the example of the person who nodded off when you were giving an answer, I notice every time, and it's been going on quite a few years now, whenever I listen to anybody speak of truth, including your tapes, I fall asleep, mm -hmm. um, which I've always thought has been a really nice thing, and I've been told that you still pick up on what's being said Anyway, even We get though told a lot of funny things, yeah. don't we? Yeah. So I'm just wondering, um, I always looked at it as a nice, peaceful thing, but obviously maybe not now. No. What's happening is there is a spirit with you who, who feels very confronted with any truth that you receive. So you have a deep desire in your soul to hear truth, so that is present, but, but the spirit with you doesn't want you to hear the truth about your relationship with the spirit. And so, and so whenever you hear anything to do, that, to do with spiritual matters, the, the spirit will want to cause you to just nod off and, and get away from the actual situation. There is a second reason as well inside of you, is that even though you do have a longing for truth, there is a fair degree of fear in you at times that you can feel quite strongly at times. And, and when truth is prevent, presented to you, some of this fear gets... Uh, brought up inside of you like you start feeling the fear and you're very adverse to, to, to the fear you don't want to feel the fear uh, fear is you feel that um, very confronted by the feeling of fear uh, rather than seeing it as an emotion you sort of see it as the end of the world does that make sense if you feel fear and as a result of that um, you just want to go to sleep and the spirit just around you just aid you to nod off so that you don't have to feel afraid Truth will always confront our fear. That's the thing we need to bear in mind. So remember, if, if we have a scale of fear where that's, that's fear, scale, the opposite end of fear is truth. Because when we're fully in truth, we'll have no fear. Right? So the problem is, is if, let's say, our fear is way up here, right, and we're, we don't see fear as a feeling, but we see it as a monster... Um, for most of us, that's what we see, how we see fear. We sort of see it as a monster and not a feeling. We don't think it's a feeling we can cope with. Right? So, so what we do is we believe that's true. And there's an emotional investment we have in believing that that level of fear is true. And that is we don't have to feel it if we believe it's true. And so what happens is uh, if, if somebody confronts us with the truth, right, then there's a tendency for us to want to shut down, to, to want to go away from the truth. So in the earlier discussion with the spirit influence discussion, did you notice how you were feeling really, really sleepy for a moment there? Did you notice that? Yeah. Yeah, and you could feel that, and, and almost you, your eyes, I, don't, I could see you, so your eyes started to glaze over, and that was that almost that point where, you know how you, just before you go off, how your eyes glaze over and, and then you're out? And you were at that stage for a good few minutes there while we were having the discussion about spirit influence. Mm -hmm. and, and that is the spirit trying to just, the spirit's trying to just shut you down so you don't have to think about that. But it's also driven by your own avoidance of trying to avoid the fear of, am I overcloaked by spirit sometime? That fear, okay. you know, that most people have actually. Mm -hmm. And that for that reason, most people don't want to discuss fear at all. I remember when I first met Mary. Mary wanted no discussion about spirits whatsoever, at all. And she would get into her anger with me every single time any spirit discussion came up, whether I started it or somebody else started it, didn't matter. And that's because of the fear inside of the person relating to the discussion about the spirits themselves. And the spirits, of course, uh, want the situation to be maintained because they get something out of it themselves, and then you just nod off and away you go. 
So what I would do is, uh, is start to list my fears, like want to acknowledge my fears. When you know that feeling, when you have that terror feeling you have quite frequently in your life, have a little notebook with you and note down all of your fears, one after the other, and then pray about them. Pray to God about helping you release them and feel them as if they're feelings rather than, than truth. Because yeah. all feelings, once they're felt, can be released. Yeah. That's how we release feelings. A child is a great example of that. You know, If you look at how children process emotion, you know, they'll hurt themselves very badly sometimes. And then five minutes later, because they've had a good cry, it's like it never happened. Yeah. Have you noticed that? Like five minutes later, and, the, and yet they're still bleeding or whatever, and still cut, but it's, they start running around like nothing's happened, you know, like, and you've patched them up or anything. But they've dealt with the emotion of it, and it's like it's gone. And, and we have the capacity to do the same with all of our emotions, including our fear. We have the capacity to get over emotions that rapidly. Yeah, because yeah, sometimes um, I have dealt with it, and then I don't even remember Having it and somebody will bring up, yeah, and I think... Oh, you know how you that. used to be like this yeah. and now you're not? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say, while I've got the microphone sure. and the opportunity, um, I find it difficult. It's almost if um, um, I'm torn between um, living life how I know it as opposed to going off on this truth path. Yep. And I just wish there was a way to combine it. It's like... Ah, uh, yes. Um, there is no way, unfortunately. No, no. Yes. Um, can I uh, just address that issue? Because it is an important issue that most people feel confronted by. It, when you're confronted with truth, it's almost like this, where this is you, and this is what it feels like. <laughs> right? And, and we're, we're sort of faced with this sort of decision that we know is going to be completely life-changing, but we're so afraid of stepping into what we call the unknown of it, that we prefer the known, even though the known's not very nice. Do you know what I mean? So we prefer this part, even though we're not very happy with it, because it's known, because we know it, and we're, we're therefore comfortable. Unfortunately, the reality is, for most of us, it's going to go like this, you know? We're going to get better and better and better, but we don't know that. And because it's unknown, we believe it's going to be like that. And so we're afraid to take the step into truth because we're afraid that we're just going to fall flat on our face a few hundred metres down, right? Rather than actually reach the pinnacle, you know, where we're actually going up and enjoying the life even more and enjoying our world even more and enjoying our experiences and even our pleasure is enhanced and all of those things. We don't really believe that. So what we do is we're afraid to take the step into truth. Now, my suggestion, this is where faith is the important ingredient, you know. And, uh, and that's something to pray for, like to pray for faith. And one way to pray for faith, of course, is to develop this relationship with God where you trust God enough to trust that God's always going to lead you in a positive direction if you embrace the truth. Many of us don't trust that. And many of us are also very afraid of, of losing what we currently have. Right? And, and that uh, stops us from embracing what we could have. See, see while, while I'm desperately holding on to these pens, I can't pick up anything else. Right? But if I, if I let them go, I've now got space to pick something else up. And that something else might be better. Do you see? But we don't think that way. We think, oh, what have I lost? What have I lost? And we're so worried about the potential of losing. And these are all emotions that God wants us to address and deal with. And that, that's a big part of your own fears, actually. And that's why when you go along to spiritual sessions or whatever, and you feel that feeling come over you of just wanting to sleep or, or, or to go into that sort of dazed place, that's because of the fear of, oh, I'm going to have to act. If I hear too much more, I'm going to have to do something about it. And I'm not sure if I want to do something about it. Right? And my suggestion is that is just a fear, it's just an emotion. And also, if you don't do something about it, um, then, it's, then the point of going is almost, there's no point, is there? It's sort of like, and I find a lot of times people come to session after session after session with, with me and Mary doing things, but, but unless they're to willing to change something in their life, 
then it's really a bit of a waste of time. They're better off spending time home with their hubby or with their kids or you know, doing something they enjoy if they're not going to embrace some kind of change through the process. Yeah. So I recommend embracing the change. Yeah. But, it is, but it is quite... You, you do feel quite a lot of fear in making the first step generally because you're so afraid of what you might lose. Yeah. Um, well, for an example, my family are, are into farming, so there's the, the animal thing and, I, I, like, I can give up meat and then I think, but then I go and buy a pair of leather shoes or something, so yep. I just f feel this push-pull all the time. And Yeah, have you um, seen my shoes? <laughs> I'll show you my shoes. These look like leather shoes, yes? I'll just, I'll just take them off. You see them? Look all right, don't they? They're vegan. What are they? They're vegan shoes. They're not made of leather. They're okay. not, they've not got any animal products in them. Yeah. So where do you get them from? Uh, I found a shop in Melbourne, actually, that yeah. makes them. Um, and he's quite, they're quite good at making them. Yeah. We have a friend in Armadale who also is making her own shoes. And I haven't got a pair of those to show you, but she's making me a, very, very, a pair of blue and yellow spats, which I'll be wearing sometime soon. Right? But so, and she actually lives on a farm. And so it's not a matter of giving up what you love, it's a matter of just changing what you love to become more loving. Yeah. And, and so, you know, obviously any farm that is just for the production of meat, that's not a very loving farm. But production of wool, that's a more loving farm. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yep. In the sense that the sheep don't die and so forth. And then uh, there, we could have farms that are for the pr production of food and the environment, couldn't we? Yeah. We could have farms that are support that support animals and, and birds and, and native creatures. We could have whole farms that do that, that, that do that you know, and that would be a fantastic farm, I think. Um, so a lot of times it's just a matter of bringing our, bringing our um, what we love into harmony with more love. We don't have to give up. So I feel what happens for a lot of people is they feel like, oh, I'm farming, so I'm going to have to give up the farm. When I love farming, well, I wouldn't give it up. Um, I would just change it so that it's loving. Yeah. And if you're living in a family that's reliant on farming, then, then help them make some adjustments to change it so it's more loving. Yeah, that's hard. <laughs> I know, it's hard. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because we've always thought it was, it's more a survival thing. That's how I was uh, yes. brought up. You know, um, animals are there for our survival. Yeah, and that's not true. Um, there are certain things that are there for our survival. But if we look at this survival thing, can you see even the word connotates fear, doesn't it? It, it, it sort of has fear associated with it. Oh, are we going to survive? If, so are you going to survive if you don't eat meat? Of course you are. Right? And in fact, you'll survive better if you don't eat meat. Yes? Um, a lot of people don't believe that because they have experiences where they don't eat meat and then they don't address the underlying emotional causes of their body's problems. But the reality is, like, I've been living without meat for nine years and I have had no negative experience from living without it. And, uh, and in fact, I can't stand the smell of it now when it's, when, you know, when it's around me. And, and when I say can't stand it, I can endure it, but it's not something I would like to sit in a restaurant with all this meat smell around me. And, and I feel perfectly healthy. Mm. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. And I don't take vitamin supplements or anything else. Yeah. Alex? Um, can I ask you if there's any way of knowing the difference between a dream and a sleep state experience? Um... There are certainly ways of knowing, certainly. Um, the, the issue most people have is whether they want to know or not, Alex. Um, but generally, um, if we look at the two things, so these are all sleep state experiences, right? Sleep, what happens in your sleep state? You can either dream, you can either be dreaming, or you'll remember events that actually you did when you were asleep. Things, things that you did. Generally, when you wake up from a dream, you'll wake up with very intense emotions. 
Because the whole purpose of a dream is to trigger you emotionally. Right? So the purpose of a dream is to confront you with the emotions you're not addressing in your awake state. So the things that you... So, so for example, many people say, oh, I'm not afraid. And then you say, well, do you have fear-based dreams? Yeah, all the time, actually. You know, I'm running from this and I'm running for that and I'm running for this and I'm running for that and fleeing this and, you know, I'm always having these kind of dreams. And you say, well, obviously you're very afraid, you know, but, but your dream is telling you that, but it's something you don't want to be aware of in your awake state. So when a person wakes up, they'll wake up, you know, pumping, 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 pumping like this, really quite afraid. And, and the reality is if you just embrace the emotion of it, you'll actually work out whether it's a sleep state experience or not. For, firstly, if you embrace the emotion, you'll realise that oftentimes the dream is just present there to trigger that emotion. Yeah. Sleep state events generally can be co-related with other people as well. So, so, in other words, other people will not generally be aware of your dream, but if other people have shared your dream, then it was a sleep state event. Does that make sense? So, so if you wake up from a, from a sleep state experience where you say, oh, I, uh, you know, I had this experience with you the other night, you know, where I was doing this and doing that, you were doing this and doing that, and that other guy goes, what? You're joking. Like... That's exactly what I was thinking, dreaming as well the other night. Then you know for certain that's a sleep state experience, right? Because the reality is we don't share our dreams, but we do share our sleep state experiences. Okay? So, so one way to know whether something is a sleep state experience is if, if the two or more people have exactly the same experience, then you know that it was a sleep state experience and not a dream. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so there are ways to, to understand when we're having actual events in our sleep state in comparison to actually having dreams. Which And the purpose of the dreams, are they are created by our own soul in order to assist us during the waking process to remember something that is going to trigger us emotionally to help us grow in the awake state. Well, it's interesting you say that because usually the dream will be towards the morning. Just before waking up. Yeah, and uh, usually they are emotion. dreams yeah. when they happen just before waking up in the sense that they are actual dreams that our, our soul, ourselves in our sleep state, it, uh, is trying to impress upon us in our awake state. It will give ourselves a message, if you like. This is what you need to address because you're not addressing it yet. Does that make sense? Whereas e events in the sleep state will often not have those kind of feelings associated with them They'll often uh, be co-relatable with other people. You know, if, another person, if another person was there you, and you go up to them, were you there? And if they have any memory of it, they might remember the event. And if they do, then it, was not a sleep, it wasn't a dream, it was a sleep state, sleep state event. There are times uh, when, of course, people don't want to remember. Um, and, uh, and quite often our sleep state experiences are, not, are either not very memorable or we'd prefer not to remember them. And, uh, and those ones are much more difficult to remember as a result and we'll only have glimpses of them generally. And then it's, we're going to have to trust our own assessment emotionally as to whether it was a dream or a sleep state event. If we, if we always go down the track that it was a dream, then we'd always go down the track that we have an emotion to deal with and that wouldn't be a hurtful thing, would it? Well, I, so, that's what I do in, in both, really. Yep. I, whether I'm having a, a sleep state <coughs> or a, a dream, yep. it's both really for me to feel about. That's the way I look at it. Exactly. I just, I just, yeah, I just had this thing. I, I, I would like to know if there's, if I can, any way of ascertaining for sure. Yeah. So quite often, if somebody wakes up and says, "Oh, you were in my dream last night, and you did this and you did that," and you go, "Gee, that's something I'd never do," <laughs> then you weren't, you weren't, you weren't in a sleep state experience with the person. You were just in the dream. Um, the, re the reality is a lot of people have had me in their dreams <laughs> for some reason and often they've come and told me and, and said, oh, you were, in my dream you were in a sleep state experience last night and I said, no, that wasn't a sleep state experience. Like, I wasn't there, uh, firstly, and secondly, I, I don't even have those emotions in me anymore. So, you know, you, you obviously had a dream rather than a sleep state experience. Yeah. But do you give um, talks in sleep state? This yep. happens quite often. 
Yep. Where I'm, I'm at talks. You, Most of you have there. attended talks in my sleep Yeah, state. I see people yep. and yep. often say, hey, you were there. And often know. some of you meet other people and you go, gee, I think I know you. Gee. I've seen this happen frequently at some of the events that we give there. Everybody's fairly new and they go out to, oh, I'm sure I've met you before. I'm sure I've met you. We all met in the sleep state at some point, probably at one of the talks that I've given or something. <laughs> yeah. That happens very frequently. There's lots of people giving talks in the sleep state, not just myself. So you're, you're doing things in your sleep state as oh, well. Trying yeah, to I, yeah, I'm giving talks myself now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. It is pretty awesome, yeah. Well, you know, a good eight hours of your life is spent in the spirit world. That's the reality. And, you know, most of us don't remember it because we're scared to remember it. And that's also the reality. If we were less fearful of remembering it, we'd probably enjoy remembering a lot of what occurs in our sleep state. Mm. Every person that goes to sleep has an experience for eight hours or how long you're asleep, you have an experience in your sleep state in the spirit world. Your spirit body leaves your material body, lets it rest, and as a result, um, you then live in the spirit world for that period of time. And most of us have a house in the spirit world. We have a regular place where we go to in the spirit world. We have regular friends and then we have new friends that we meet up with and we arra make arrangements with. We have, and as a result of that, we have deja vu feelings on the earth. That of Yeah, well, I've organised this, obviously, because I just had a deja vu about it. So I knew it was going to happen today. Uh, things like that. Yeah. We went out the other day, didn't we, uh, just looking at land. And I got in the car and immediately, you know, just the getting in the car triggered a memory for me from a sleep state planning of the event. Yeah. If, with, if you see people in your sleep state experience and clearly they were not asleep at that time, mm -hmm. is it that it would be a dream or is time not that linear? Um, it, would most, it would be a dream. A dream yep. If they're a person who lives on earth, it would be a dream. With the exception of a person who's potentially reincarnated, it would be a dream. Okay. Uh, a person who's reincarnated can have multiple bodies attached to their, to their mm -hmm. soul. And so, therefore, you may have met one of their other bodies it, still yeah. operational in, their, in, the, in the spirit world. Okay. So, but, but it's very rare. So, m for most people, it's just a... It would be a sleep. Be a dream. Be a dream. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. The reality, too, though, is that many of you have friends overseas that you regularly meet up with in your sleep. Because... Um, when I, because there's overlapping times of when we go to sleep compared to other places in the west of the world. And so when you're asleep here, um, sometimes there's people who are asleep from other countries and so you'll meet up with them in your sleep state. Right? And sometimes you even arrange in your sleep state to go and visit them in your awake state at some point in the future. And that's why you actually have a feeling, I want to go to Brazil or I want to go to Mexico or... <laughs> because you've actually met some people there already that you want to tee up a meeting with in your awake state. There's so many fascinating things that happen in our sleep. Yeah. Okay. Um, still on dreams. When, uh, do you know what's happening when you wake up at sort of 3, 4 o'clock in the morning on a regular basis? Yeah, you wake up then? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You're asking why? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. And you always wake up with a dream. Generally, a, a dream wakes you up. Is that how it is? Uh, not that I can no. recall. Not that you can recall. You just wake up at the same hour pretty much every single time. Yeah. And what do you feel when you wake? Um, almost as I've been sort of kicked out of somewhere. or um, I don't know. It's, um, I don't think it's sort of harsh as rejection, but almost. But a feeling of rejection is what you feel? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, every time we wake up at a certain hour, generally, it's our spirit friends who are our guides or our guardians who are trying to wake us up so that we experience an emotion that they feel is a blocking emotion, blocking us from further development. Does that make sense? So a lot of times we'll have our guide or guardian who's also a spirit uh, with us in our sleep state and, and they help us wake ourselves up 
so that we remember something that's important for us to address or deal with. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And, and it, the key there is to always again examine the emotion that you wake up with. So if it's an emotion of feeling almost rejected or pushed away, an emotion of feeling pushed away, um, then, then allow yourself to feel that emotion rather than just going back to sleep. Yeah? So just lay there and feel the feeling of that rejection or being pushed away feeling that you have. And, and as you allow yourself to feel it, you'll start to find that the flavours of it, and, and it'll be related to either a male or a female. You know, if you think about that, who does it feel related to? Okay, then. thanks for that. Do you know who it feels related to? Um, I think I'm fairly blocked to the emotion. Yeah? Um, yeah. But, but that's the dominant that. emotion you feel when you wake up in that moment. Mm. Yep. So that's the thing to start with. You want to focus your attention on that. Because mm. it's, it's usually always somebody or yourself trying to help yourself to address a particular emotion that is preventing you from embracing your life in a practical way. Yep. If I can ask on an unconnected thing, I don't know if you have a planned talk on... I'm interested in the relationship of other species. A little bit closer. I'm interested in the relationship of other species to God and to humans. You mean other species, meaning animals, animals and, yeah. and birds and yeah. lizards and other creatures yeah, and viruses and all sorts of things? Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, um, I have given some talks about it, right. but um, it is a very interesting subject that probably needs to have more said about it. Um, can I just give you a little brief outline yeah, that, um, of what it, what it is? God has created all of her creations. God created an environment for us. So God created the environment first, actually. Um, and the purpose of the environment was to educate what, what I would classify as the highest of God's creations... To educate the highest of God's creations about God. So, so what God did was create an environment with the specific purpose of putting human souls into this environment. All right? Now this environment included all living creatures. And all of these living creatures would become reflectors of what is going on for the greatest of God's creations, which is the human soul. And the beauty of what's done, what God did is create this environment so that, so that the human soul would have things to reflect back at itself to learn. Right? So absolutely every animal, every bird... Every creature, every single living organism that exists on this planet is right at this moment completely reflecting the human condition. If the human condition changes in a positive direction, so will the environment. If the human condition changes in a negative direction, the environment will reflect the change in the negative condition. Always. Every living creature. And it's in particular the living creatures that reflect the environment the most. So in other words, the animals will act out behaviours that affect, affect, are affected by the human condition. So when animals attack other animals, it's a pretty good idea. You can see pretty clearly what is actually occurring. People attack animals and people's attitudes towards other people are being reflected by the animals attacking other animals for example. If viruses attack whole groups of people, you can fairly well see what is occurring. There's got to be something inside of each one of those persons that accepts the virus without processing the virus naturally and releasing it from the body. Our body is uh, totally capable of processing all sorts of living, very destructive organisms and yet surviving completely without any, without any effect at all. So many of you are aware of that, yes? How your body is completely able to combat any disease. Right? But it has to have the circumstances and situations to do so. That's generated by the soul, the human soul. 
And so God created this beautiful reflective environment and the reflective environment includes all the living creatures and the living creatures in particular are going to reflect our soul condition the most with the exception of one type of creature and that is our own children. They will reflect our condition to the most extreme amount. But the rest, so in terms of the reflections that occur of our condition, we can put it in some kind of priority order, and this is how it works. It goes firstly, our children, then, intelligent. Central nervous system based. Creatures have the next level of reflection. The reason why our children have the most is because they have a personality of their own and a soul of their own. And therefore they will have the greatest reflection of our condition. The reason why these are next is they have a personality of their own with no soul. And so they will actually embrace our condition to a, to a degree and reflect our condition. Then we have the creatures with no central nervous system. Right? And the creatures with no central nervous system will reflect our condition less, but will still reflect our condition. And then we have, of course, um, living matter that is not uh, that is not self-determining. So I'd call things like trees and grasses and all of those kind of living organisms. They reflect our condition the next. And then we have things like viruses... <laughs> and single-celled organisms and things like that that reflect our condition. So all of those things are perfectly arranged to reflect our human condition. And um, the reason why God's adjusted in this way is because these are the things we care about the least, generally. These are the things we care about the next least, the next least, the next least, and the most. Does that make sense in terms of our level of care? And what God does is God is always attempting to influence us in every possible area of our life, from the things that we care about the least to the things we care about the most. And, and so God has created this feedback system, which uh, we can embrace if we desire to, which will tell us everything that's wrong with us in terms of what's our in and out of harmony with love. Yeah? Right from these living organisms right the way through to, to our children. Yep. So the top levels of things that we care about are the ones we're going to most notice? I guess. Well, the are things because we care about them the most, we notice them the most. But can you, see, can you see also, if we are not willing to change for the sake of our children, then it's highly unlikely we're ever going to be willing to change for anything else. Can you see that? And if we're not willing to change for intelligent animals then it's highly unlikely we're going to be willing to change for anything else below that. And if we're not willing to change for the creatures like insects' sake, and we poison them to death and like we do now, and you know, then we're not going to be willing to change for anything else less than that. The reality is that God... Remember I said yesterday, God is trying to sensitise us. Yes? He wants us to be completely sensitive to absolutely everything in our environment and if we're completely sensitive to everything in our environment we'd be willing to change if we were just affecting one of those things negatively but if you think about it for most people they're not even willing to change for the sake of their own children <clears throat> they want their children to change for them but they're not willing to change for the sake of their children um. I don't have children, but I do That's have okay. a dog. Yeah, so there he goes. He's in that capacity there. So his condition he, is reflective of mine and yes. he's telling me about me. He's telling you about you. He's a perfect reflector. Uh, I guess because, um, you know, I, I 
Well, hold it just a bit closer, please. Yeah. Um, <coughs> the question that I have is why just human souls? Why not, you know, dogs with souls? Dogs don't have souls. And uh, the reason why humans so have souls is because the soul was the greatest of God's creations. So God's creations range from a whole, a whole heap of what you would call matter, right, the way, which is very, very small matter, down to adamantine particles, very small particles, which we haven't yet discovered as humans, right the way through to the human soul is the greatest of God's creations with the greatest capacity to grow and change. And every other soul, every other creature, because there's no other souls, is in between those two ranges of inanimate matter right the way through to the human soul. So the human soul is the greatest of the creations and inanimate matter is the least of those creations. And God has a whole range of creations, all for our enjoyment and learning. And in fact, God will teach you how to create for yourself many of these things in between as well. Through, because God wants her children to learn everything. And that's the reason why God's created that way. But the human soul is the greatest of God's creations. Yeah. And, and no other creature has a soul uh, because the human soul is the pinnacle of the creations of God. Mm. Thank you. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and so if we embrace the soul and then see its effects, my suggestion is try to see your soul's effects in all of these small areas. Because if you do that, you'll get refined quite well. Don't wait until your children reflect at you or your pets reflect at you what's going on with you. Because there are literally other things that are already reflecting at you what's going on with you. Like you have viruses in your body and sicknesses in your body that are telling you what's going on with you already. You have, like, you have way insects interact with you. It will tell you what's going on in your body already. You don't have to wait until the big things happen in order to learn and change. You can, you can be a bit more refined than that and notice the small things that can cause you to change. Yeah. Um, so I have a question about desiring and receiving God's love. Mm -hmm. um, so I can understand before we reach at one moment, it's really our emotional injuries and humility that's um, restricting our ability to receive um, divine love and even affects our desire. But once, um, once souls reach at one moment and then they no longer have those emotional injuries and what's affecting their desire and their ability to receive divine love then? Like why are some, some of them seem to be able to progress more quickly? Like what's driving it then? Yeah, let's answer that. It's a good question. Um, if we examine the construction of the spirit world, and, this, and when I say spirit world, I'm really talking about the universe, really, because it's, these are the spheres or dimensional existences, and then there's the one condition on the eighth dimension. Now, as you correctly point out, up until the seventh dimension, we are basically learning to release what I would call earthbound, unloving ideas and concepts. Does that make sense? So during that period of time, we're actually releasing stuff based around our fears in particular, our false expectations, our false beliefs appearing real. Now, um, that, that obviously has a large impact on whether we receive love or willing to receive love or not, because obviously we can be blocking, we can be pushing it away. So th there's two things that affect our receipt of love, and there's two things that actually affect our receipt of most things. And that is, the first one is our desire or our will, and the second one is our blocks or our injuries. They are the two things that affect our ability to receive. Now, during this period of time, we're developing desire as well as releasing blocks. Can you see? Now, when we start down here, our desire for God isn't very great generally. You know, we've been injured a lot and we often generally don't have a very strong burning desire for God that we recognise and embrace. 
But as we begin to progress and release blocks, the desire for God just builds. It builds and builds and builds until such a time as it's quite strong, like it becomes the number one priority in our life. And in fact, our desire for God needs to be the number one priority in life before we actually make that transition. So, so by that stage, desire for God is the number one priority in our life. However, um, the desire that we have after that point is very dependent upon how we've viewed the importance of having the desire in history. So when I say historically, what I'm saying is, during this period of time, when I was on earth, so this is down here in earth, and in particular when I was on earth, my desire is affected by the things that I know. Isn't that not true? Yeah. Like, you know, like, if I know something, something's possible, then I might have a desire for it. If I have no blocks to it, in the sense of I don't, if I believe it's not possible, and, uh, and, and I truly believe it's not possible, then I'll have no desire for it whatsoever, generally. Mm. Does that make sense? So our desire is very much affected by our belief systems, mm -hmm. by what we imbibe, particularly here on the earth, about and what we believe. So we may release all of the unloving behaviours in our soul and we actually may have as our strongest desire our connection with God mm -hmm. that causes us to make this transition into the eighth dimension. But there still might be beliefs that we have about desire itself that may affect me. Does that make sense? In, a, in a other words, I'm still experimenting with here, still experimenting with desire and how it's actually engaged and what I can actually do and, and how my imagination can cause me to believe that something is obtainable or not. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. so, so what starts affecting me here now is how willing I am to believe that anything's obtainable mm. and, and how, um, how much imagination I have, really, in a lot of ways, mm. and how much I'm willing to believe that God is good and desire a stronger relationship with God than I already have. So what often happens is we have a life on earth that is quite often quite traumatic for many people. We pass over in a spirit world and we slowly release the trauma of our life and then we make this transition into where we're now at one with God in the way that we believe everything to be right? and, and in our feelings and as a result of being at one with God we, we now feel very very happy we've now released from us all of this baggage from our past and all of the unhappiness from our past is gone now if you could imagine for a moment that that somebody grabbed you as you are now and placed you in an environment where all of the baggage of the past was wiped away from you. Uh -huh. you most of you put your hand up for that, right? And, and that you're completely happy, you're never going to be sad again. You know that you're immortal as well, that you can never die. And you know that whatever you do now is going to be harmonious with love, whatever you choose to do. And you know that you're allowed to choose anything you want. And you're surrounded by people who are all the same. So every relationship you have is also a really good relationship. Right? And on top of that, let's say you've also met your soulmate and that's also she, she or he is also at one with God and therefore you're going to have a beautiful relationship there as well. Now, you'd feel pretty content, wouldn't you? Mm. Don't you think? So one of the emotions that arises at this point is contentment. Now, there's nothing wrong with contentment, is there? It's a fairly nice state and emotion to be in. The problem with contentment, though, is it can cause us to stay where we are for a long period of time because we're just so happy with where we are. Why would we want to change? Can you see that? And, and so this desire to get closer to God sort of almost takes us... It's like I'm already at one with God in the sense I'm at one with God's thoughts and feelings on truth and love. 
I don't, haven't yet discovered all the truth because truth is infinite. So I haven't yet discovered all the truth. And I haven't yet received all the love that I could receive because love is also infinite. So I'm just at one with God in terms of how I think about things and feel about things. And my soul's been transformed enough that I now can do all of my injuries are gone. I've been transformed into a new creature. No longer do my injuries define me. Does that make sense? But I've become so content with that state. I go, wow, this is a beautiful state. This is an amazing place. I'm going to stay here and enjoy this for as long as I can, right? And in the process of becoming content, we have a tendency to search less. You see, oftentimes in this period of our life, we only search because we're in pain. We don't search because we get pleasure from the search. Do you see the difference? See, see sometimes on earth in particular, we, we search. When is the times we search the most? When we're in pain the most. It doesn't make much sense really, does it? But that's what we do. Because we're in pain the most, we're searching for a solution to the pain. But see, there's no pain here. So pain's not a motivator anymore to search. So what is the motivator to search? The potential of more pleasure. But if I'm already experiencing lots of pleasure that I never imagined I could experience, can you see that I may now have a tendency to slow down my search? And many do, actually. Do that. Yeah, in the pageant messages, that they often speak of that, that they're just so happy and they can't kind of even conceive that there's more happiness because exactly. they're so happy where they are. But then they also speak of this quality of divine love that the more you receive of it, that the more you desire it, but That's it doesn't true, leave you feeling uncontented. Yep. You feel content with it, but you... You always feel content from there on. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. but you still desire it more, so... Yep. Yeah, that's why I was. But so it's really the your willingness to imagine and desire that there is more. Um, well, often for most people, like I'm pointing out, pain be became the motivator for progress. Mm. But but at this point, there is no pain. So if pain was our motivator for progress, now there's no pain. So now what's going to motivate our progress? Now there's going to have to be a, a really burning desire that motivates our progress. Mm. A desire that we w want to grow beyond what we currently are, even though we're totally content with what we currently are. Yeah. Does that make sense? Mm. And that, that is a very interesting emotion to develop. Mm, very much. And, and in fact, we can develop it on earth. Uh, and yeah. those, in fact, those people who develop that on earth do better in the spirit world as a result mm. because pain's no, not their motivator. When pain is the motivator, the pain eventually disappears and then what do you have to motivate you? You can see you need to learn to have a different motivation and that's a part of what you learn after the condition of atonement, how to have a different motivation. Now, for some people, they learn the motivation as not being pain at a very early stage in their development. So they might even learn it on the, uh, uh, learn it on the earth. Mm -hmm. And if they learn it on the earth, then pain is no longer the motivator. Mm. And can you see that? So once they hit the eighth dimension, they won't be waiting in that place of contentment because pain's not the motivator to get to the ninth dimension. Pleasure is the motivator. Mm -hmm. right? I know that I'll always have more pleasure the closer I get to God. And that becomes the motivator. But it takes time to make the transition between those two states. Mm -hmm between pain being the motivation and then understanding that pleasure can be the motivation to continue progression. Yeah. And uh, because of that, many people, once they reach these higher dimensions of the spirit world, slow down in their progression for a long period of time. Mm. So I have known people in, this, in these spheres for hundreds of years yeah. or longer um, because, because I haven't yet made that transition mm. between between pain and pleasure being the motivator for their progression. Yeah. Thank so, you. Makes sense? Yeah. Mm. If we go to just behind and then down the front. Oh, I have a question about uh, us receiving um, information from God. And yesterday 
you said that when we're not feeling God emotionally, God might um, just give us signs and you made a little list of about four things. Um, mm -hmm. And under signs was God might try to affect us with our thoughts. And I have a confusion on that because... Um, God can only affect us with our thoughts by, by asking somebody else to plant a thought in our mind. So th that if God did that, they would be our, our um, guardians. Yep, our guardians would be asked by God to give us a certain thought, uh, which they would, they would willingly do in order to teach us something that we're not yet learning emotionally. And in fact, many times our guardians are already doing that with us. Mm. Or our guides are already doing that with us. And if the thoughts aren't from them, they're thoughts from spirits, which may be malevolent yep. or not. Yep. So it's always best to go back to the feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. If the if the thought is malevolent in nature, in other words, it's to do with harm, harm of self, or harm of another person, or acceding to an addiction, you know, following along an addiction, then you know for 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 sure that that thought or feeling never came from God in the first instance, don't you? Because it came from a, a, a perfect person who's wanting to degrade your condition. And if you actually hear a voice, does that yeah. mean that's a malevolent spirit? Not necessarily. Um, it could also be a benevolent spirit. Right, but, so but what is the voice saying? Exactly. So it's always, what's this voice? For a while I was having spirits <laughs> saying things to me that I, 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 in the end I said, if he or she speaks English, don't trust them. <laughs> but if I feel that it's a loving thought and I, and I feel into it, that's the best way to go. Exactly. It's always best to an analyse everything that you hear, ever from people on earth or from the spirit world, with the same intent, which is, is this a loving thought or feeling that they're trying to impress me with? So even if when you have a discussion with another person on earth, it needs to be the same analysis, exactly the same analysis. Is this a loving feeling or thought that this person is trying to give me? Thank you. And then, just don't miss. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> I have a mother who's dying, mm -hmm. and I hate her. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I don't know how to deal with it because I should be compassionate. She's completely closed off to like living in denial, basically. Yeah. And, and I living have in denial about what she's done to you. E oh yeah, oh definitely. Yeah. No, no. I try and explain to her that what, how she is being, it was done to her by her, from her female lineage, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I cop, I copped it in yep. the end, right? Yep. Yep. Now, I don't know how to deal with her because she's going to go to the other side soon. Mm -hmm. And I would like to be nice to her. Mm -hmm. But every time I see her, I feel irritated. Mm -hmm. And I'm also getting the feeling of irritation from, like coming from within myself towards other women that are possibly similar, like this nice lady next to me, yeah. I feel completely irritated by right now, <laughs> right? right? Yeah, yeah. So I don't know how to... <laughs> Interesting law of attraction that you're sitting yeah, next yeah, to. Yeah, it <laughs> is. <laughs> the key is to not feel hurt about that, just to feel about that. Yeah, yeah, so I would like to be able to assist, but I feel completely helpless. Well, firstly, um, for you to be able to properly assist... Um, you're going to need to go through... Now, now, firstly, I want to state firstly, your mum has done some very damaging things to you, right? So she has definitely done some damaging things. Damage to you. And she is also in complete denial of her damage that has been done to you as well. So she, she does not even agree that she's done anything wrong towards you. Is that not right? Yep. So, so we must first acknowledge the truth of that. The fact is your mum's in a pretty dark place if she can't acknowledge to her own children the damage she's done to her own children. Yep. And uh, it's pretty sad that, that it's like that. So, so mum's in a dark place already, 
isn't she? From an emotional perspective, she is in spiritual and emotional darkness in the sense that she has no understanding of love whatsoever, really, in, in this place. So that's her condition. We need to state her condition accurately. So every person who ever helps another person in the spirit world or on earth must first learn to accurately see the person. And that includes accurately seeing them with the things that they've done in terms of the darkness that's within them. It's not judging them. You just need to know where they're at before you can help somebody move from where they're at. Now, here's you. Now, this damage and denial have created feelings in you, right? Now, the feeling you describe is a feeling of anger. But underneath the feeling of anger is obviously a feeling that an addiction is not getting met or a need is not getting met. And underneath the addiction would be a fear that there's something wrong with you that's caused your mum to treat you the way she has. And underneath that will be a, quite a lot of grief inside of yourself. Does that make sense? So that's what's in you about how she's treated you. Now, you can do a couple of things with that. You can wait until mum recognises what she created. That's her creations that she created in you. Does that make sense? Now, you can wait until this person who is already in total denial and who you've had many chats with already about the subjects of what she's done and she's been in total denial about all those things that you've talked to her about as well. And you can wait for her to recognise what she's done before you change, if you want. It's not a very advisable course of action because she, being the person who created the damage, is going to have a much more difficulty than you to see the damage she's created. Does that make sense? So, that's one course of action, which is a course of action many people on earth take, which is they wait and wait and wait and wait and wait until the person who's done the damage feels bad about the damage they've done. Now, my suggestion to a person is never do that, but there are lots of people who do that, and often they are waiting hundreds, if not thousands of years as a result, waiting for the person to feel sorry for what they've done. So what you're waiting for from her, to a degree, is a feeling that she is sorry, yes? You want her to feel sorry for what she's done. No. Pass the mic back and... Because oh, I can feel you do want her to feel sorry, but let's go. Well, not sorry as such. I just want to feel that she's not in my space, so to speak. Yeah, no, that's your denial now. Yeah. Your denial is you'd just like her not in your life at all. That's what you'd prefer. Pardon? What you'd prefer is for her to not be in your life at all. Correct. Yeah, you're exactly. Yes. And that's anger. Yeah. <laughs> Does that make sense? And underneath that anger is this fear and, and deep grief that yeah. she isn't sorry for what she's done and she doesn't recognise what she's done and all that kind of stuff. That's the feelings you're avoiding. Does that make sense? You are mm. avoiding feeling how bad you feel about what she's done well, by I'm... being angry with her. Uh, yeah, well, I cried at her place the other day. Yeah. But, I mean, that didn't make any difference. Of course, <laughs> because she is totally numb to what she's done. Completely. And, and you crying is just going to make her angry. Yeah, so I can do nothing, really. She's going to pass to the other side. It's not true. It's not true. Oh, okay. I want to continue with the discussion. <laughs> right. What I'm saying, though, is that you have all these emotions inside of you as a result of what she's done. And at the moment, you're choosing to maintain this state, yeah. which is a state of, you know, repelling her. You want to keep her away from you. You don't want her to damage you anymore. And that's understandable, given how much damage she's put on you. You can understand why you feel that way. I'm not saying it's not understandable. Remember, I acknowledged in the beginning all of the, ra all of the yeah. bad things mum's done. That's right. Yeah. However, if you wait for mum to repair this problem then you'll be waiting for a long time because she's obviously in total denial. I'm not waiting for her. I want to be able to Let, do something. I know what you're doing. Let me finish what you're doing. What you're doing is not even waiting for her anymore. Right? What you're doing is you're just angry with her now. Right? You, you, and you want to hold on to this anger. You would like to hold on to this anger. You don't like it very much, but you feel you're totally justified staying angry with your mum now. I'd like to give it to her, but I can't because she's old and frail. Well, even if you could give it to her, you still can't because it's in you. <laughs> Does that make sense? Like, 
and you could give it to her, but then you're just doing to her what she's done to you. It wouldn't be very good either. So, so what you finish up doing is that you're holding on to the anger, right? Now, when you hold on to the anger, you're, you're not yet in a position where you can help anybody. Do you understand? And you can't help her if you form an addiction with her, and you can't help her if you want her to feel your fear either. The only way to help her is to release all of this, right? And get to the point where you now can just feel love for her. That's very, very difficult. I agree. It is very difficult. And that process is called forgiveness. Yeah? And, and for, for your own sake, you will have to go through that process. Not for hers. For your sake. Because if you do not do it for your sake, this anger will destroy you. Right? It will really harm you. Your body, your physical body it will harm, your spirit body, and it will also harm your soul while you retain these emotions. So at some point, we personally, if we've been hurt by others, at some point we personally have to love myself. I have to love myself enough to actually address these emotions without expecting mum to ever do anything. Does that make sense? Does everyone get that? Like, You have to love yourself enough that you want to no longer have these emotions in yourself. And to do that, you're going to have to allow yourself to go right down into the grief of how mum's treated you. When you go down into the grief about mum's, how mum's treated you, you release the grief and then you'll have forgiven her. Does that make sense? Now when you forgive somebody, now you're able to love them. When you're able to love them, now what you can do, you can do many things for them. So what I'm suggesting to you is that you can't actually do anything for your mother while you stay in your current state with her. You can only do something for her if you decide to go through this process. Because anything you do without going through this process is just a facade. And if we're going to live in harmony with truth and love, without the facade, we can't act upon the facade. So I have to, if I am in a state where somebody's damaged me and I have all these feelings about the damage that they've done, I need to feel my way through all of those feelings and release them from me. Once I've done that, I will forgive the person. It doesn't matter whether they're sorry or not, I will still have forgiven them. And even if I never see them again, I won't be carrying around the damage that I've done for the rest of my life. And that is an act of love towards yourself. So the process of forgiveness is not only an act of love towards the other person, but it's also an act of love towards yourself. Can you see that? Yeah. And so if we are truly going to, to help any person who's... And I, and I know one of your concerns is that mum's old now and she's about to pass and... You know, who knows what's going to happen to her in the spirit world? I agree. Who knows what's going to happen to her in the spirit world? Well, God knows that, but not many others do. So, you know, she's aged now. And in a lot of ways, you're afraid to address these emotions with her because you're afraid of the effects it's going to have on her. But it's already having an effect on her. Uh, she's already having, feeling the effects of you having these emotions anyway. And in the end, your mum is going to have to go through a whole group of emotions about what she's done to you. She will have to. Whether she likes it or not, she will have to. Now, she may at some point in the future embrace that process. But if you wait for her to embrace that process, and you wait until she embraces that process before you allow you to be happy, then you're going to be waiting a long time, potentially. I know that. So that's yeah. why I'm not waiting. Well, no, you are currently are. Yeah, but currently are because you want to maintain this place. Yeah, there's a lot of energy there. Well, when you say there's a lot of energy, um, there might be energy there, but it's not a very good energy for you or for anyone around you, actually. I know, it's horrible. It's horrible, yeah. And, and what we need to do is get out of that place and into the fears and into the grief that we feel. We need to allow ourselves to sink into these emotions and into these emotions about what mum has done. 
Once you release those emotions, you will now have forgiven her. Once you forgive her, you can now love her. And now when you give her a gift of some kind, it will be only through love and not through some other feeling, some other hateful feeling or revengeful feeling. Now, for this reason, any interaction with her that you currently have is going to be very much surrounding the emotion that you currently feel. Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. That's why I asked the question, because I don't want to carry on like that. Yeah, I understand. And um, Firstly, though, you've got to acknowledge that, that the reality is your mum's done a lot of bad things to you. I've already, you know, had years of writings about it. You know? Yes, so you've acknowledged it, but are you feeling it? See, are you allowing yourself to feel the grief of it? Really cry about it, how mum's treated you? You see, most of us are willing to acknowledge what's happened, but we're not that willing to go to the emotions of what it feels like as to what's happened. And they are the things that are going to heal us. You see? And they are the things that are going to help us forgive. And then when we forgive, we're in a state of love. Once we're in a state of love, we can help the person. Yeah. I particularly want to help. <laughs> well, no, you don't have to. But once you're in a state of love, you'll want to. Yeah, that, <laughs> Does that make sense? You. Once you've forgiven, you've got no reason to not help her. And, and this has happened to many people in the spirit world where they've had to go through all of these particular emotions and got to the point of forgiveness of the people who've harmed them. And I know people who have... Like, I, I know some people in the spirit world who have been pulled apart on a rack, tortured to death, and they've eventually forgiven the people who did it to them and actually eventually helped them to find God. Right? The very people who tortured them to death... Um, over a long period of time and so it is possible to go through this process but you have to go through the process as a feeling process yeah thanks AG pleasure it's a very good question what you ask because it is one of the main reasons why most people do not change they don't they don't want to get away from this place because it does feel powerful you know it feels like yeah, now I'm now I, I'm going to make sure this never happens to me again type of feeling you know and that face place feels very powerful but it's very soul destroying and and so for your own sake the process of forgiveness is very important to go through so if if anybody has ever wronged you Make sure that you do not wait for them to apologise before you forgive them. Because if you wait for them to apologise, you'll be waiting for a long time before you feel good again. Yeah. Now can you explain why she's, why I've been attacked too? Why you've been... Attacked by her? Do you feel you've been attacked? With what she said, I felt... Well, it's interesting that you feel attacked because I didn't feel it was an attack. It was just a statement of how she felt, which is different to an attack. Does that make sense? Yeah. She can recognise quite clearly that there's obviously feelings and emotions inside of you that remind her of her mother. Mm -hmm. And that's what's caused you to sit together, actually. Well, I was sitting here. There was a space between us before. <laughs> yeah, if you use the microphone, here. use the microphone so you explain. <laughs> So you were sitting there before and she was over there and then she moved towards you even, yes? And can you see how that's, uh, that's something that these are the kinds of attractions that occur just to trigger specific things inside of us, yeah? yeah. But also there's an indication there that uh, there must be some emotions inside of yourself as well that are similar to the emotions that, that her mum has for you to be attracted to sit next to her. And you've got to ask yourself what they are. So, and, and the key is to not judge yourself with it either. It's just the key is to ask yourself what they are. Well, ask yourself what is drawn. Now, there's plenty of people that come and sit right next to me and hate me at the same time, and I don't get offended by it. I wasn't really offended. But you were I, offended. I, I was curious to, to the statement Well, no, you feel made. hurt by it. You feel it was an attack, and you feel hurt by it. Whereas many people come up to me and say, AJ, I hate you for this, I hate you for that, and I'm not hurt by it. So, so the fact that you're hurt by it is the place to start. Does that make sense? Admit to the hurt, the fact that somebody feels that you remind her of her mother and her mother has been very damaging to her in her life, 
Allow yourself to feel the hurt of that. And then allow yourself to go deeper into that. Well, why have I feel so hurt about that? Because it might be something completely unrelated to her mother. Does that make sense? The key is to allow yourself to feel why you feel hurt. So the law of attraction always works perfectly. It doesn't mean that you are like her mother. Does that make sense? So there are many people who come and treat me like I'm their father and I'm not anything like their father, but they treat me like I am. Does that make sense? So just because somebody treats you in a certain manner, it doesn't mean that you are like the person that they don't like or that harmed them in the past. It means that they feel similar things in you or they feel there's certain personality traits that remind you or remind them of your father or, or whatever. Or they have a very strong emotional blockage towards some kind of thing that's in your nature or qualities that, uh, that is their emotional injury. They could also have that. But you've got to feel your way through that. When you feel hurt, you don't feel your way through it. You just feel hurt. And hurt is an anger response. Many of you don't understand that hurt is an anger response. Because uh -huh. when you feel hurt, what are you actually feeling inside? You're blaming the other person for how you feel. See, that's an emotion of blame going towards another person. That's an angry response to, the, to, to what's happened. So... so if you get, like somebody says, oh, somebody right next to me feels like they feel like, you're, feel like my mother and you feel hurt by that, you're actually feeling angry about it and you need to acknowledge why. And then when you acknowledge why, you'll get underneath that as to what you're afraid of or what it is or what caused you to come. And, and you'll start analysing that a lot more clearly. If you don't do that, then you won't learn from the interaction. But it doesn't mean that from any interaction that you're at fault it just means that there's some kind of thing that's attracted to you. And myself and Mary have thousands of things attracted to us in the course of a day, as you can imagine, many of which are quite negative. Like, you know, I have people emailing me with lots of abuse. And, and that happens. It happens to Mary when she gets things emailed to her, you know, men sexually att attacking her and all sorts of things, right? So these things happen. And we've got to look at our uh, what, what, what does it feel inside of us? What's the feeling that's being triggered that we need to release? Embrace and release. That's what we need to do. Does that make sense? So let yourself go there. Let yourself feel that hurt and feel the, like you've been falsely accused of something that you didn't... And you're only sitting there for... Anyway, <laughs> you've never said anything. <laughs> you're just sitting there. And, uh, and let yourself feel about that. And you'll feel feelings of being treated unfairly. And then a lot of those feelings will relate to your own childhood. Does that make sense? Of things that happened in your own childhood where you got treated unfairly, you were accused of things that weren't actually happening and so forth that you need to feel about yourself. Thank you. All right, just straight behind. Um, I'm sitting here too with a law of attraction. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that mother um, who did the damage and denial in this in darkness is my mother in the spirit world mm -hmm. and you said to me yesterday that I'm still stuck in the anger towards my mother mm -hmm. and I want to deal with this mm -hmm. and the next step down is addiction mm -hmm. and I'm looking at it now and I'm feeling blocked. Could you give me an example? Yeah, sure. When we've been treated really badly when we were little we automatically form addictions because it, our parents, when they treat us badly, don't allow us to feel our grief. Uh, to give you an example, our parents might come along and smack us for something that we didn't do, for, for example. They thought we did it, but we didn't do it. Now, in that moment, you feel quite a number of different emotions. You feel unfair, tr unfairly treated. You feel uh, rejected by your parent. You feel misunderstood and quite a number of other different emotions, right? Now, if we're not able to feel the actual emotion, which is unfairness, injustice and all those emotions then then and a lot of times our parents go you know I'll belt you if you you know cry about this or something like that so they then put a layer of fear on top of that emotion as well then we go into trying to have the addiction met so what we do in our life then is we whenever injustice is around we are very angry and whenever we see any injustice we want to act straight away Right? 
And this is because we have an unhealed emotion inside of ourselves that, of our own injustice that we're acting upon all the time. And so we're addicted to people who always are just with us. And then the people who are not just, we're addicted to attacking them as well. <laughs> Does that make sense? Because of the underlying grief not being released. Let's say we felt rejected. So, and then our parents didn't want us to cry about the rejection. So now the rejection and the fear of the rejection is in us as well. And so we create an addiction. What's the addiction? We want everybody to accept us, whether they like us or not. <laughs> They've got to accept us. They've got to tell us that, that, that we're good, that we're wonderful and they love us. And, and anybody who doesn't tell us that, no, nah, they're no good. And anybody who does tell us that, and they might be just speaking off the top of their head with no feelings whatsoever, but we accept them because we think they're wonderful because they meet the, the addiction. Does that make sense? Now, these are the addictions that when they are not meant, drives our anger. So, when somebody comes along and doesn't meet your addiction of being told that you're wonderful, now you're angry with them. Does that make sense? But if somebody comes along and does meet your addiction and tells you you're wonderful, even if they don't mean it, you're not angry with them. And the reason why is they're meeting your addiction, which is covering over the grief of the fact that you don't feel very good about yourself and that you want people to tell you that you're good. So everything that we don't allow ourselves to feel about in our grief, we create usually the opposite addiction. So if we were rejected, we want people to never reject us again. If we, we feel listened, not listened to, we want everybody to listen to us. If we feel unloved, we want everybody to love us. If we feel uncared for, then we want people to care for us. If we feel like we had no money, we want people with money around us. You know, and so forth and so forth. We usually set up these addictions. And whenever the addictions are not met, which is fairly frequently in our day-to-day -day life generally... Because we have the grief driving that attraction, we skip into anger as a result. Does that make sense? So that's the relationship between the anger of wanting to hold on to the damage is about not looking at what we're addicted to. And what, like, so if my mother rejected me, then I'm going to be re addicted to women who accept me. Does that make sense? Because I don't want to feel the emotion of being rejected by a woman. Because as soon as I feel that, it reminds me of my feelings with my mother and it feels terrible. So I don't want to feel that. So I only want women who accept me being in my life after that. And that's my addiction. And then when I attract a woman who's not a person who's very accepting, I feel really angry and frustrated with her and I want to bop her in the nose. And, you know, because she's triggering all of the unhealed grief within me, all the grief I haven't yet released about my mum is being triggered in that emotion. And that tells me that I'm addicted to having a woman feel good about me. That's my addiction. My anger is great because it tells me everything. Yeah. Thank you. And my mother is in the spirit world very angry mm -hmm. and hating me and, and wanting to harm me. Mm -hmm. And I don't... I've been told that I... I, I don't want to have an addiction with her. I think I have fear of her. I don't know quite how to... No, no, you, you want to have an addiction with her. Right. Yep. If you, if you look at it, the, the thing you want to do is you want to be angry with her. Like, she's done bad things to you. Of course you want to be angry with her. You want to be, you know, you, you would like to have her get what's coming to her. <laughs> feeling is, is the feeling you have. Now, because you have that feeling towards her, she feels even more inclined to interfere with your life. Does that make sense? The beauty is if once you go through this experience and release the grief, number one what happens to you is that you now no longer feel any feelings of rage or anger or any other feelings towards her. So that's great. She no longer feels any rage feelings or other feelings from you. So, so she's not going to attack you anymore trying to prevent you from attacking her. Does that make sense? And then, and then secondly... It has the effect upon her that you've gone through all this emotionally and now you only feel love for her. And ironically, that's going to make her feel like, wow, you know, she loves me even though I've done all these bad things. And that's going to actually cause her to think more about the bad things she's done. At the moment, all she's thinking about is preventing your attack. So what happens is the angry person who was created by this person who's also angry 
starts to attack this person, and this person is, I don't deserve that, I don't want that, I'm going to attack you back, and then the person gets, I'm going to attack you again, I'm going to attack you again, I'm going to attack you again, to attack you again like so, right? Did you feel a bit of that emotion? Yeah. And, and we end up with this constant stream of attack going back and back and forth. Now those people are bound together by rage. Their mutual rage for each other binds them together. Right? Now you don't want a life like that. Right? So the only way to avoid a life like that is to actually go into yourself and into your grief and eventually get there and forgive. Once you forgive, you're no longer inclined to attack back no matter what attack comes at you from anyone. And as a result of that, you're in a state of love no matter how another person is responding to you. Once you're in that place, you are now no longer governed by your relationship with that individual. Does that make sense? You're no longer controlled by your rage. You're no longer controlled by your fear or your grief. You've released all of those things. So you're no longer controlled by them. Any emotion you refuse to release, you will be controlled by. So if you refuse to release grief, you will be controlled by your grief. Your denial of grief will control your life. If you refuse to release fear, your fear, the denial of your fear, will control your life. The rest of your life will be controlled by that emotion. If you refuse to release your addictions, your addictions will control the rest of your life. Does that make sense? Any emotion you refuse to address will control the rest of your existence until you release the emotion. And that makes no difference whether you pass or not. You can pass over and if you pass to the spirit world and you still have that particular emotion, you are going to be controlled by it. Until, and it's going to rule your life until you work your way through it. So my suggestion is to not wait and work your way through them right now, as fast as you can. That's fantastic. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. So you get also the relationship between the anger and the addictions. Yeah. You can see that many times, many times the person who has harmed us the most is the person that we have the most addictions with. Because they are the person who did not meet all of our needs. And they are the person we desperately want to meet all of our needs. So if our mother treated us badly, we will have most of our addictions with our mother, most probably. If our father treated us badly, we'll have most of our addictions with our father. If both of them treated badly, then we're going to have a mixture, obviously. But usually it's the parent who treats us the worst that we have the most addictions with. So the parent that didn't like us the most, the parent that treated us the worst, they are the ones that we have most of our work to do with because they, they are the ones that we have most addictions. And we, and we are so specific with our addictions sometimes that we only want them to fulfil it. <laughs> and no other person will do. So, you know, like, when it, when it comes to, let's say, daddy has hurt us in a certain way, we will want daddy to fix it. We want daddy to make it better. And then we're waiting, waiting, waiting for daddy. And we'll try and get these other man substitutes substituting for daddy. But it doesn't matter how much they substitute for daddy. I still want my dad to sort this issue out, right? And the reason why is because our addictions are often also very specific. They specifically relate to the individual who never gave us the feeling that we desperately needed or wanted at the time. Yeah. And we need to get rid of that if we're ever going to have a happy life. Yeah. Okay, well, um, it's nearly time for us to finish, but I just wanted to discuss one thing with you, and that is that uh, there is a group of people here in your local region who are looking at setting up a learning centre. And uh, the guys have been looking. We went out looking the other day for a bit of land and stuff like that, and it's been quite interesting what's come up. And uh, I just wanted to let you know that so that, uh, that you could, um, if you wish to be involved in that process, that you could connect with the guys who are already doing that. Now, Karen, I think you've got a... There's a piece of paper up the back next to the donation box that if you would like to be involved with knowing what's going on with that or be involved in that in some way or be involved with a group 
locally here in terms of looking at divine truth and divine love type material, then please put your name down on the back and the guys will uh, take notice of that. Now, do you mind giving... Uh, do you mind me writing some of your contact details? What are your contact details on the net? I can't remember. Um, so you've got a... Uh, that's an email address that you can connect to. Yeah. So this is for the local region in Bathurst, Orange and that kind of region if you like. Uh, and Karen, I should write your name. So it's Karen Henry. Um, yeah, give Karen that. Right. Yep. Um, yeah, that's probably the best, just to contact me by email. 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 I don't know if anyone else, just because I move around a little bit, just for my mobile number, it's yep. not the best way to contact me always. Yep. So, I don't know if, so, yeah, maybe Tony, if you want to call anybody... Do you, do you want to give your details, Tony, or do you, do you not want to? You're not comfortable? Well, so Tony is Tony Newman. Thank you. Um, I can put my uh, email address is Zena, Z E double N A. Z E double N A. Yep, botanicals. At bigpond.com. Yep. So you can contact either Karen or Tony. The guys know what's going on with, you know, looking at land and so forth. And what I've been doing is just spending a bit of time, myself and Mary, be spending a bit of time with them talking about the type of things that they'd be looking for and things like that. So, um, but also if you want to have a group here where you meet you know, regularly or semi-regularly, that's really up to you guys. We, myself and Mary do not organise those kind of things. Um, we just tell people that they're available if you have them available. <coughs> With groups, what we rec re recommend is that, uh, is that you watch a bit of material or, or read a bit of material to do with divine truth and then just discuss it in terms of the learning things. What also we have been doing, Mary and myself... And Mary's been running some book groups uh, which discuss a book with a group of people where you read a chapter of a book and then, you know, look at the material. It's all spiritual-based material and what, what you can learn from it. And in the future, we're also, discuss we're also creating a study group where, where we're writing some material um, to help people study a certain subject about divine truth. Um, and the first study group will be about humility, actually. On the internet as well, um, so this is, I understand that these are not things related to myself and Mary specifically, these are what a local group of people here who understand, who understand some of the principles of divine truth and divine love want to do in your local area. Does that make sense? You want to, Mary, if you get a mic rather than just... Just to mention that Karen can copy talks for people. Oh yes, Karen uh, has a hard disk drive... Um, that we've put all of the talks that we've done that we've mastered at this point. There's still probably more to go, but we, we've and and we've put it on a hard disk drive. It's a if you need a copy of it, you'll need a 500 gigabyte hard disk drive. But on it is every single video presentation that we've done up till now, and every single audio and every single document we've produced, as well as a lot of other documents are all on the one DV, the one drive. And you, can, you, can, you need a computer to access the, that information. So Karen is happy to do that copy for you. It takes uh, anywhere from six, four to six to about ten hours to do the copy because there's so much information. Uh, if you downloaded it all from YouTube, it would take, it's, it's over 400 hours of videos on that disk alone. So um, if, you want, if you want information about all sorts of subjects... Uh, they're all listed in uh, year order, I think, though, the way we've listed them at this point. Okay, um, so now we'll talk, we'll just let you know about um, what myself and Mary have organised. The website we have is called divinetruth.com.
And you can download any of those things also from that site. We also, there is a, if you do a search on YouTube called the Divine Truth Channel, you will find all of the videos so far that we've uploaded to, to that site. Now, there's not every video yet because we're still uploading. It takes about, uh, about six hours on the average to upload one video. And we've still got another 50 or 60 to upload. So it's going to be a while yet before we finish uploading them all. But they're, they're all put into... If you look at the Divine Truth channel and you go there, there's a button on the left-hand side that you can go called Playlists. And on the Playlist button, you will see listed all the Human Soul series of talks, all the o Overview of Divine Truth series of talks, all of the interviews... Uh, there's a welcome series for people who are new and with, su with suggestions of what to watch first. There's, uh, there's human relationship series of talks. There's a relationship with God series of talks. There's a spirit relationship series of talks, spirit life series of talks and so forth. There's all these different series that are listed. And you just go to the playlist and you'll see all the series listed. And in the series, you, you'll find the different subject material related to that particular series. Does that make sense? You can now also search the material for the date. Uh, so if you know a certain date of a type of thing you'd like to watch on the, on the YouTube, you can search the date. So, so for example, you can go to the Divine Truth channel and search for the date. But the way to type the date is like the reverse date order. So that would be the 12th of November 2009. Does that make sense? The reason why it's like that is, that is that that means they all get sorted in order via computer. And it's, it's actually the Japanese way of displaying dates, but it's also the most practical way of displaying a date. Um, and it means that when you search 2009, you'll get all the 2009s. If you search 2009-11, you'll get all the 2009 Novembers. Does that make sense? So it also makes it easier to search. If you, you can also search using words like, like the human soul or something like that. And if you put it in quotations, it will search that whole thing as one thing. And, uh, and it will list all the talks relating to the human soul for you. So that, that's what happens on that site. There's around 400 hours of videos on that site. Um, but all of, there's even more videos on the disk. Um, so... The other thing we're now doing as well, which we're going to tell you about when we upload the new website, is that we now have these little USB sticks um, where you can email uh, the, the office account or... So it's office at Divine Truth. The squeaking is annoying, some of you. Mm. Uh, or there's a DVD. I think it's just DVD at Divine Truth. But Office is sometimes the best because that's completely manned all the time. Just email them if you want only certain videos but you have a computer. We can actually copy those videos. We can copy up to 10 videos onto one little, little tiny uh, memory stick and send it all to you. If you want all of the documents we can copy all of the documents and quite a few videos onto the memory stick. The memory sticks are 16 gigabytes and we just, if you just email us with what you want, um, then we can send you back via post. So there's no cost associated with any of those things. Is there any questions about that? So if you want to find out more. Okay, well, I'm a bit tired now, so it's time for me to finish, I think. Um, thank you so, so much for your time over the last two days and uh, we'd like to thank you too for the donations that we've received over the last two days. We'd love to thank the people who are involved in organising everything for us. Um, they've actually paid for our accommodation, they've also paid for Lena and Igor's accommodation, they've paid for the venue hire here and, um, and without their assistance I doubt whether we'd even be here. So we'd like to thank you guys. Um, there's, there's, there's Pam, 
Tony, Karen, and there, you mentioned, Pam, there might have been some others as well. Sue. Sue. And, and Jolene. So there's a few others also who are involved in donating for those things. So we'd just really love to thank you for, for doing those things for us and, and helping us enjoy our time together over the last two days. So thanks for that. Um, myself and Mary will be catching up with a few of uh, them again tomorrow with the Learning Centre details. So we'll talk, we'd like to talk to you before you go home um, to, uh, about that tomorrow. And uh, then we are off on Tuesday up to Armadale um, into the Kentucky area, which is between Armadale and Tamworth, uh, and staying with the guys there. Um, and we'll be doing a bit of a presentation next weekend there and we might even have a bit of a sing, uh, a presentation singing as well uh, with a group, with a band and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but it will be in a wool shed so if you think of coming it's going to be quite cool so you need to rug yourself up fairly well. Yeah. Alex? Is there a book group on Wednesday at all? Um, there is a book group, there is going to be a good book group, isn't there, in Armadale. At one o'clock, I think Mary has organised it, in the orange room at uh, Armadale. The details are on Mary's blog. Yep, yep. Um, I haven't listed your blog, but it's available off of the divinetruth.com site. But it's something like Mary... Yeah, I can't... Re I'll have to... Re the actual... Your, your blog, what is it? www.mag... Delina dash Mary dot blogspot dot com dot au. Yeah. Pretty long winded. There is a shortcut to it on the, the about Mary in our divine truth dot com. And in fact, in the new website, if you click on what's new, Mary's in the new, new website that we'll be uploading hopefully next week, um, when you click on what's new, it'll come up. With, uh, we usually put what's new on Mary's blog first because I don't get a chance to update the website <laughs> that often. And, uh, and there is a shortcut to Mary's blog on, on that location, on the what's new page. Mm. Okay, well, thanks for your guys' time and hopefully we'll see you again at some point in the future. I'm not sure when. But uh, hopefully it will be. Thanks.